Welcome everybody to this very last session on the second day of the April Annual Meeting 2021. Um, we started the day with a conversation session around digital ethics and we are ending the day not with another conversation session around digital ethics, but an actual working session. So we are really happy and we that is the task, ABLE Task Force on Digital Ethics and ePortfolios to welcome everybody to this session and we look forward to working with everybody. And you've really said everything I was going to say on this slide, so we'll just go straight to Teresa and she can start us off. Oh, okay, um, and the next uh, slide is the overview. And as you can see, we have a lot planned for today. We will all have an uh, introduction, which we are currently engaged in. And we're going to be asking everyone to tell us their name, where they're from, and a little bit about their interest in ePortfolios. So um, if you want to be thinking about that, then we will tell you uh, how this task force came about, what the goals are, a little bit about the history, and we'll introduce the second version of the principles. We're assuming that some of you are here because you're already creating ePortfolios and you're thinking about aspects of digital ethics, or maybe you're using other kinds of online media, and some of you want to get started, but you are wondering how you're going to work around some of the dig digital ethics challenge. And then the exciting part, we're going to have um, a hackathon. And at that time, everybody will get to choose which principle they are interested in. You can see some of us have got numbers next to our names and, and everybody else will be adding numbers as we go on. And that is the principle that we are, are going to be responsible for discussing. So you get to choose which principle that you'd like to talk to talk about and work with us in a room to read through the principle and come up with your own ideas, questions, um, anything that you think we could add, suggestions for continuing this work. And we're, we're excited to find people who are interested in joining us on this task force. So this breakout a room activity will last maybe about um, 45 minutes because we do want to leave time for a debrief. Uh, we'll go through, see what people have come up with and talk about the next steps and, and how you could join us if you want to in uh, to do future rounds of digital ethics. Okay, so if you haven't done so already, can you type in your name, where you're joining from us and what your interest is in this topic? All right, we've got lots of people, um, some familiar faces, some people who are maybe new to ePortfolios. I should have said, I'm Teresa Connerfree from Santa Clara University in West Coast, California. I use ePortfolios in my class. I've been using them for a while, but more and more I'm concerned with digital issues, digital uh, aspects of privacy and all the other topics that we're gonna come to discuss today. So let's see, we've got uh, a variety of colleges, states. Can we have the next slide? Yeah, so this is very exciting. Um, we have here the links to our presentation, the exact presentation that we're giving today, and also the PDF. And you can either copy that URL and you'll get the presentation, or if point your camera at the QR code and it'll pop up, you'll be able to see the both versions, both the presentation and the slide and the um, PDF of the slides. Thanks, Teresa. I'll also say I see some people that are saying they're new to ePortfolios in the chat and I'm especially excited to have your voices in this um, hackathon or create-a-thon. That's one gap that we've talked about is having people that are kind of new and being able to identify things that maybe might not make sense to someone that's new to the field. So I'm really excited about that. Um, on that note, I wanna quickly talk about the group agreements for our session um, and just propose some ground rules. And I would also say, feel free to add additions to these ground rules in the chat. Um, so consider the nature of this session. You can choose to change your Zoom handle to remain anonymous as you contribute to these discussions. As you noted earlier, the session is recorded. So we wanna make sure that you're aware of that and make choices accordingly. Um, everyone is here to learn and to challenge their notions and biases. Listen without judgment, be open to receive feedback. I'll also say be open to giving feedback. We are we really want to hear kind of the raw feedback that you all have. So please be um, comfortable being honest and open in your thoughts. Um, we want to discuss the thoughts or the arguments, not people behind them, especially when talking about your institution or your experiences. Um, and we want to keep what people share in the breakout rooms confidential. 
So um, those are just some group agreements that we've come up with. Again, feel free to add in the chat as you see fit. So hi, everybody. I'm Christine Slade from the University of Queensland in Australia. And this is my second year on the task force. And I just wanted to answer this question. What is the ABLE Digital Ethics Task Force? Well, it's a, a group of scholars and um, practitioners in e-portfolios that are working together to um, really sort through, I guess, a very important area around ethics, um, specifically in e-portfolios, but also relevant to a lot of just online use that our students um, are now faced with even more so. So next slide will tell us, um, show that lovely pictures <laughs> of the 10 people that have been on the second um, year of the task force. So if you're unsure what how this actually unfolded, um, just briefly, because Me Megan's going to say a bit more, but it, um, it came about because of um, a need for this area. And we've had two years. So in the first year, the group actually did the first version. So you might see on the slides version two. Well, this is the group in front of you on that slide that have done version two. And we'll explain that a bit more to you as we go. So next slide just tells us um, briefly as to how this came about. Um, so we recognise that it was an undeveloped area of research and scholarship, and it is a topic that's rad, um, rapidly changing as we all have experienced in the last year and a half. And it's an opportunity for an international organisation like ABLE to advocate. So that's still, I guess, in the making, the advocating part, but uh, we have very um, comprehensive um, thinking and um, writing, I guess, about what these um, ethics should be. So Megan's going to tell us a bit about the history of how that came about. Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Mize, and I am the Director for ePortfolios and Digital Initiatives at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the task force. Uh, we, as a community, had discussed uh, multiple issues of digital ethics over the years uh, at ABLE conferences in 2017 and again in 2018 and 2019. And it started to become quite apparent to us that this was an urgent need for us to come together as a group and start thinking about this in a way so that folks at their individual universities and institutions weren't reinventing the wheel over and over again or, or discovering content anew. And so following uh, the ABLE conference in New York City, we put out a call for task force members and invited ePortfolio practitioners to join together to try to, to develop these principles that you're going to see today. And so we started going through a process where first we looked at examples uh, that mirrored kind of what we were thinking about doing. So for instance, we looked at something like uh, the National Councils of Teachers of English and CTEs, online writing instruction principles and other similar documents that strove to give kind of broad principles with practical solutions that folks could then use in local context. Uh, and so after we looked at that, we then gathered and started brainstorming what is it that we think are the ethical issues that students and faculty and administrators face when they advocate for e-portfolio use. We then came up with, and in my notes, it says a monster list of ethical issues. And we started prioritizing what we thought needed immediate addressing. And so throughout the fall, we drafted in groups uh, the various concerns, hypotheticals, potential solutions to those problems. In January, we presented a draft to the ABLE board and received feedback. Uh, and then pre-pandemic, uh, we did some major content revisions on that document and started thinking, well, we've written something that we think might be useful, but how do we actually share this with the community at large? Because we don't just want it to sit on a website going unused or un unknown. Uh, and then in the summer that year, we did a fairly technical edit. I want to give a great acknowledgement to our leaders at that time, Amy and Sarah, who are amazing. And uh, Sarah in particular, I want to acknowledge her work on Scalar, <laughs> which is where the document resides. 
And so then we kind of did a rinse lather repeat for the following year, which is fortunate because we were going through a pandemic. So we were able to kind of repeat that process. Yes, thank you, Amy. And um, we put out a call for participants following the ABLE conference. We then started looking at what we had produced and, and, and wondered what are the gaps that we've produced from these principles. And I think we actually came up with five new principles we wanted to tackle, realized that was a bit ambitious, pared it down to three. Um, and, you know, again, went through the process of drafting those in groups, feedback, uh, sharing it externally. And we've just recently completed a technical edit of the document and the digital text once more, really striving to remove hierarchies um, and think about different ways of categorizing the content because one of the things that came out of that second year is this content can't really be separated into clean, distinct principles. Everything we're talking about is woven together and inherently affects one another. So um, that brings us to today in which we would really like to do a deep dive into some of the existing principles and, uh, and invite you all uh, in the community at large to help us continue developing these. And I'm gonna hand it over to Christina now. Thank you very much, Megan. And um, what we are going to look at today are some of the principles from version two of the principles, because as was said in the first year, we had 10. And now we've been working on three principles. And you might think, oh, 10 versus three, why are the, why is the second year more time intense? And it really comes down to that the principles we selected for the second year were just more comprehensive and larger in general. And so the principles that you can see here on the slide are all the ones that are now available via the Digital Ethics Task Force, and we are launching them today. And the ones in bold are the three principles we worked on particularly over the last year. And so that was diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and decolonization as one principle, visibility of labor, and also evaluation. And we've seen all of those three things being touched on already really well in prior sessions um, at this annual meeting, along also with the uh, some of the principles from last year. So in today's um, session, you will be able to look into some of those principles. Now, what, how are they all structured? Um, each principle follows a very uh, follows the same way of presentation so that we have consistency in there. And that means that we have a short overview statement of what the principle is about. Then we have strategies for applying that principle in research, teaching, and uh, your own practice. And these uh, strategies are then also informed by a number of scenarios that exemplify how the principles can be used to, ben, uh, to the benefit of students and also faculty members. And then to, at the end, there's a list of uh, related resources that you might want to check out and um, familiarize yourself with if you want to learn more about it. And thank you, Amy, for putting the link into the chat to the Scala site where you can see the principles themselves. And so I'm handing over to Morgan. Hello, everybody. So I'm excited to talk a little bit about the goals of the hackathon this evening. We have been hard at work putting this together, and now we want to invite more people into the conversation with this um, hackathon. So um, what we want you to do, if we could go to the next slide, please. We want you to help us see what we are missing. We want to know how you might apply these principles in particular contexts, and we want to be thinking about what should we focus on for the third year of the task force. We are excited to be thinking about how to move forward, and so if we can go on to the next slide, I will briefly describe how we're going to move forward. So what we will do is here in just a moment, after you've had a chance to open the Scalar link, we will be going into breakout rooms. Uh, in those breakout rooms, we'll have an opportunity to talk through and to read through the various um, 
uh, messages that are available to us. And then we will um, sort of hack out what those things are that we would like to add. So what I'd like to do at this point is have everyone who is leading one of the breakout rooms talk through what the principle is briefly in one sentence, and then what brings you to this principle. So support Megan Mize. Hello, everyone. Um, so in support, we wanted to talk about the ways in which institutions must provide infrastructure and acknowledgement and support for folks engaged in ePortfolio uh, implementation and ePortfolio construction and ePortfolio assessment so that it is not simply invisible work that goes, uh, I hate to use the word again, but unsupported uh, in, uh, in ways on the back of just a few eager individuals. And I'm, I'm drawn to that because that is my job. I help uh, do faculty development and instructional design in relation to ePortfolio work, but I also oversee and design ePortfolio tutoring for student support. So uh, I'm very invested in advocating to institutions that this is, uh, is real work that really needs uh, dedicated labor for it. Hello, and I am Teresa Connifery. I am going to be in the room discussing promote awareness. And I'm drawn to this principle. It's like a meta principle. It's maybe uh, a way into this topic. If you have been creating student e portfolios in the past and maybe not thought so much, or occasionally there's been something unsettling, maybe with uh, images or content that students have shared, or you've wondered, what happens to these e-portfolios, where are they stored um, after the students create them, what's next, then you might be interested in this principle, pro promote awareness. So it covers, it's a general instruction to all kinds of aspects, ethics, security, data collection, storage, and lots more. So this is for creators, students, um, platform hosts, administrators, all of the above. So principle three and room three will focus in on practice. And what the goal here is to talk about the various ways that we as uh, portfolio creators can actually practice through throughout the building process and multiple times throughout a process career so that students especially, but also other creators have an opportunity to try out new things rather than to have a one shot at a portfolio. So I'll be taking number four, which is respect author rights and reuse permissions. So that's quite a big topic, but really it's around looking at e-portfolio creators, understanding and respecting um, materials they use from another author and how to actually go through the maze of what attribution you need to give and whether you can use it or not. And then also to be fair about the representation you're giving to that work. So unfortunately, we aren't going to have breakout room five uh, today, but we will have topic six, which is uh, the breakout room I'll be leading on accessibility. Uh, in this room, we're going to really think about accessible technologies and how we can ensure that uh, the ePortfolio creation process is accessible in addition to preparing ePortfolio authors uh, to create accessible products at the end of their, their labor. Um, we really think of accessibility broadly, and so this includes users with disabilities, but it also includes users who are viewing ePortfolios across devices, who have limited access to uh, bandwidth, and so it, it's sort of a broad umbrella accessibility. Um, I'm Megan Haskins. I'll be leading the evaluation breakout room. Um, in the evaluation principle, we kind of start to tackle the idea of assessment. We started out with an assessment principle and realized that we were going to write another whole document. So right now we're focusing on evaluation of student portfolios and thinking about how to co-construct co that evaluation with students and make that process really clear and transparent um, for the instructor and for the student. 
And last but not least is the principle on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And I selected that because we encounter it everywhere ourselves. And as also as team member of a platform provider, I was drawn to it because we, of course, also want to make sure that we provide tools or workflows that encourage students to, to feel safe and um, also to feel welcome on the platform. And while Kevin and I were working on this principle, we've realized that decolonization, the last D in now our abbreviation of DEIBD, um, also deserves a special place and should not just be lumped together with um, the other four, because working with Indigenous students and also staff does have some special requirements that we want to be conscious about and also recognize. So going forward, we want to optimize our breakout rooms. If you would, in the um, name for your Zoom character, please change your name to have the room that you would like to join. So you will put in one, two, three, four, six, seven, or eight, and your name. And then we will sort people into the breakout rooms. In the breakout rooms, we will have time to look through that particular principle. We'll read through it. We will have an opportunity to use hypothesis to make annotations. So if you already have a hypothesis account, you'll be able to use that to add in your annotations. If you don't, your leader in the breakout room will make those annotations for you. And let's see. I think I am supposed to talk through the adding annotations slide, which um, you will follow the link. You will click the arrow in the top right hand corner. You will log in or sign up, depending. You will highlight the section that you want to annotate, click annotate, and then type in your comment and click post to public. And if it seems a little daunting, we will be playing around a little bit. It's a safe space. We will try it out. If things go awry, we will figure it out together. So I think at this point, I will say that we have 40 minutes in the breakout rooms. So please change your Zoom name so that you can identify which breakout room you would like to go to. And we will start placing folks in. Um, but it's fantastic to see that um, we, we pretty much have everybody in, in different breakout rooms and nice and small groups so that we can have uh, good conversations uh, happen in there. Um, if you already, um, while we're waiting for the breakout rooms to be recreated, if you'd like to jump onto the scalar link already and uh, start taking a look at the principle that you have selected, then that would be great preparation. So I think everyone is back now. Um, I hope you all had a wonderful discussion. We had some great ideas in the accessibility group, not to brag about the, the folks in my breakout room, but all kinds of annotations are on our document at this point. So uh, I thought it might be good for us to just talk about how things went um, before jumping into these debrief discussions. And so uh, I, I'd love to especially hear the facilitators of the breakout rooms, like what, what did you notice uh, when you discussed your principle with uh, the participants of the hackathon? And I'm happy to model that practice. So one thing I really loved about our discussion is we all inhabited very different perspectives and contexts. And so it was really lovely to see people pulling in. Well, you know, at my institution, we had an issue with this and this is how, what we had to do to seek out. Or um, we had a scenario about internships and Brandy leads an internship program. And so it was really cool for her to be like, oh, we might, you might actually think about adding this detail. This is a problem I encounter a lot um, administering this program. Um, so, so how did everyone, everyone else's uh, breakout room discussions go? So I would agree with that, Amy, because the three of us had a really useful time talking about scenario, the scenarios mainly, um, and special groups of students that you might have um, that can't. So for the example we used was the military students and how they can't reveal a lot of things from their past to put as artefacts in their e-portfolio and how an educator or instructor has to work around that or 
so I guess it reinforced the fact that, yes, it's all good for the creators of ePortfolios to have all of these things, but it's a lot of work for the instructor or the educator for one, knowing actually, because we were covering things like, you know, copyright and that, but to have a, 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 um, a grasp of all the different issues and then know what's the right thing to teach this to use to teach the students and then what's the best way of actually doing that so when we put these things down we're actually asking more of some groups you know to actually add something into a crowded curriculum or actually to have to spend time going looking forward or something so I think we need to be mindful of that you know it's easy to put things down but maybe there's other stakeholders in what we're saying that will actually have to do something more um, and maybe we should be supporting that in some way if we recognize it. So I had a, a fascinating conversation um, with Barry Keith from Japan and we, we discovered that we both had taught in Japan which was which was quite a coincidence um, and we we're talking a little bit about our experiences. Interestingly we were at different ends of Japan but I discovered that um, Keith is, or, or Barry's working, um, is part of the ePortfolio Institute, the AACNU ePortfolio Institute with, um, I guess, Helen, Tracy, and Eddie. And um, in Japan, ePortfolios are still quite new. And so there are all the kind of considerations of platform choice. And it's interesting in Japan too, because it, um, the platform would need to be able to accommodate the Japanese characters as well as as Roman characters, so we were thinking about that, and we when we went through started looking at the principles, we noticed um, the issue of open access. We, we thought that that might come up as a term that needed to be defined, and um, sure enough, that was a term that we that we discussed what that meant. So that sort of confirms what we thought already that we do need to define open access. Um, we talked a lot about biases, different kinds of biases, but yes, this principle promote awareness brings in so many of the other uh, of principles and um, strategies. So it, we kind of was we were trying to not get too caught in the weeds because those are topics that are, are going to be explored in depth by the other principles. So for the principle on diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and decolonization. We had more of a conversation rather than going through the text itself because there's quite a lot of text. And um, so we looked at as, uh, quite, a, quite a bit actually into the aspects of decolonization and also how faculty could be, or what faculty could do to get to that point that they are feeling comfortable talking with students about these topics and supporting them. And therefore really looking at, well, what is your role in the decolonization process? And um, then another point that was brought up is around, also in the portfolios really being supportive of different expressions of um, concepts that we normally would put into writing or so. And so an example was that an instructor in, at a Canadian university um, had their students create wampum belts that are belts um, signifying a contractual agreement and put representations of that into the portfolio. So really take an indigenous practice and use that and not try to put it and kind of try to convert it into a more colonial one. And so really looking at giving students the choice of expression and also then in particular also valuing those expressions. And an idea that um, was mentioned then that could potentially even be something that we do in year three of the task force is how to involve people more and how to also involve students in looking at the principles, working with them, seeing where do they see themselves? Um, should there be other things included? And have students do a review as well as, of course, also people in the various communities that um, we are talking to and that we are wanting to be represented, that we are also bringing them in and have them have everybody voice their opinion. Just to follow up on that, um, in the evaluation uh, conversation, we came up with an idea in terms of what year three might look at in terms of research projects and sort of 
creating a database or something of who is doing what with regard to e-portfolios and trying to sort of get a census of e-portfolios so that we can connect people to different resources. Um, and the uh, image idea was something that was connected to something that we were thinking about as well. It might be helpful since the principles are so text heavy if we could have some short infographics that were associated with each of the principles or the scenarios just so that as we are trying to introduce people to the ideas in them, we might have something that we could put up on a slide that would help us um, get to those introductions a little bit faster. Um, and then moving into the textual representation. Our, our conversation was wide ranging. I'm going to slip in as room one with Helen and I talking about support. And I, and I would like to start by saying how appreciative I am of things like ABLE and sessions like this, because in that moment, it became really clear that the community is so important. And when we talk about support, uh, Helen and I likewise had a conversation, caught up, she mentored, and we certainly touched on the principle. But as we spoke about what has happened during the pandemic, et cetera, uh, as, as things grow, it really struck me that our principle uh, for support was one of our first ones. And thus, I feel it's kind of a little shapeless as we've become more sophisticated in what we want. And so um, as she and I were chatting, she hit on something that I, I thought this is completely absent in the support principle, which is the longevity of support. Uh, institutions love to throw uh, short-term solutions at us uh, but in the long run, that causes a lot more work and time for individuals. And, uh, you know, it was it was a wonderful question. And I thought, yes. Uh, and then we started talking about what other mechanisms count as support. So things like space for scholarship on teaching and learning so that this work is uh, going towards databases and things like that or time to, to come to communities like this, you know, time uh, in which leadership gives you that space and you're not in 50 meetings and you're not advising and you're not whatever, because that's support too. And that needs to be in there because I don't think we reference that. But also she asked me, just as we were discussing a hustle, hustle culture in academia, like, how do we know e-portfolios have made it? How do we know that they're sustained? What support structures imply long-term commitment? And, um, and so those were all really good questions that got me thinking. And then I'll stop talking, but she posed one that I loved. And I really hope Abel will consider over the year because we've been talking about what students, faculty, and admin can do. And she said, what can Abel do that is support? for e-portfolio practitioners. And we had a few ideas there, but I think that's a really good conversation for us to continue. Those are really excellent questions. I think we have one group that we haven't heard from. Or Morgan, you were, you were with Megan H's group? Yes, okay, Morgan awesome. is visiting us. Perfect. Uh, so now I, I, I would love to transition us into the, the questions that you see on the screen or any of the questions that um, Megan rose uh, in her, her comment, because I think there's a lot of rich discussion there. Um, so maybe we can start with like the new principles. What, what doesn't seem to be addressed yet in this document? What's missing? So I don't know if I would say it's a new principle, but uh, what emerged from our conversation was having a more diverse set of voices, um, basically confirm that we're on the right track or guide us to improve where we can. Um, and so that definitely rings true for the diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging and decolonization, but I'm guessing it also can spread across all 13 principles, especially when we talk about including the student voice more. And maybe it's not even fully new principles, but those, those expansions and consolidations and or making things more specific in certain other principles. Yeah, and, and so Megan has added in the chat also alumni and employer voices. Are missing. 
I think too, one of the things we've talked about and we've started moving towards with our use of categories and tagging that I think as we continue, that needs to become more aggressive um, is, is the connections between the principles and the overlap. Because when we talk about support, we're really talking about visibility of labor. And when we talk about visibility of labor, we're really talking about X. And so um, especially with that earlier comment, someone made that this is we would love new practitioners to come in because that can be overwhelming and, and mind melting. So if we can kind of chart pathways through these conversations, like as when you first come in, this might need your most urgent attention and, you know, et cetera, because you can't learn it all at once. It's, it's too much. And Brandy uh, just posted in the chat, um, employers and community partners will matter even more at institutions picking up co-curricular transcripts, using portfolios as evidence um, and assessment of learning. Yeah, and, and Brandy, just to kind of connect that to the moment that we're in, I keep, and to, to a point that Megan and Helen discussed about how, how do we know e-portfolios are effective? How do we know they they've, have done the job we want them to do? we're kind of all entering this, this age of budget cuts, this age of austerity following COVID. And so um, how, can we, how can we use data to show that, that this is having an impact for students on their digital ethical literacies, on their development of the digital professional self? Like how, how can we show that work? Yeah, Amy, we talked about that as well. Like how do we document the ways that we enact these principles and portfolio practices generally, and how do we build into that process ongoing evaluation and then capture, you know, we did this thing and here's what we learned and now we changed it a little bit, um, you know, as we moved into the next semester or into a next year or whatever it might be. And I think the challenge is, is that we're all very busy. And so I know, at least I, speaking for myself, I always have very good intentions around that. And then, you know, you, you get tied into other things, but creating processes and we did, um, excuse, part of my French, but we talked about a portfolio to document the ways that <laughs> we do these things, heaven forbid. But um, yeah, so just sort of thinking about how do we actually capture the conversations that happen in a moment in time and the work that's done and then how we're leveraging those forward into new, um, new things uh, in, in the future. I think that that kind of really touches on what we discussed in our um, task force meetings around what could year three look like? Um, what do we want to do then? And uh, yeah, creating resources would be a possibility, supporting campuses more, maybe even running workshops. So I'd be interested also hearing ideas from, from you all here in the chat, what you would find most useful um, of what the task force can support organizations with. And I just want to verbalize what Barry put in the chat because it's getting some buzz, which is like a principles for dummies. Well, okay, don't don't love the phrase, but love what we're tapping into, which is like, how can we make these lofty ideas of digital ethical practices immediately transparent, concise, and, and applicable? Uh, so I, I think that's a really great future project. We spoke yeah, about that. No, I think the, the promotes awareness is quite general, but if you're not there, we need one before you get to the promote awareness that the, there are issues that um, that come even earlier. Yeah, and I was just going to add to Barry's earlier point. We even went so far as to kind of think about what an institute might look like for people who are interested in getting this kind of thing started off the ground. Because um, Tracy and I and Morgan were talking a little bit about like, you know, it's one thing to talk about co-creating a rubric with a student, but if you're not even sure what an e-portfolio rubric looks like, that's a big lift. And so thinking about how can we support people at their individual institutions, being aware of the politics and the context that goes along with e-portfolio work? Um, because it is sort of a, a snowflake situation, right? Every institution has different contexts and different needs. Yes, I think um, Megan just muted herself. She didn't just drop off unless somebody yeah, pulled sorry. your phone like <laughs> Yeah, I was really, Amy said it, you know, the institute model, I think, works really well for that kind of work. Sorry, I'm getting artwork thrown at me as I meet myself, so I'll end there. I did wonder whether we should, um, I haven't checked it thoroughly, but combine the, the principle that we had um, 
with the privacy one and whether they group neatly together um, because what we're talking about in representation and using other people's work and that privacy is part of that conversation. Um, so I, I, I guess the problem would be if they were both well established, how you would, you know, not have to make a much longer document. But I think that sort of thing might have to happen. Um, so just throwing that out as an idea because, you know, the trouble with this too is that, you know, so I, I part of my work is around digital literacy, digital ethics, digital this, digital that, you know, and so I'm conscious there's a suite of digital topics or things that go into this space. And I think if we're just going to look at ethics, we should try and keep to that in a way um, because if you start branching out too far, you're probably going to have another whole volume of what does it mean to be a digital citizen or a digital professional or whatever. So I think that's probably a basic decision to be made because uh, we could go on and on. Um, and But I do also think that e-portfolios can be siloed across from other digital formats. So it might be valuable to put something in that actually links these ethics. So I see all these ethics in anything digital, not just e-portfolios. And maybe we could put something in that explains to people that you could use this outside of that one example that obviously we're passionate about, but uh, get wider audience to say this could be used for anything online. Um, so yeah, a couple of a couple of ideas there. Yeah, I just want to echo a point that you made, Christine, which is that this, this has really prompted us all to see how much work still needs to be done. Um, yeah. And if you're thinking like, what, what, how do I get started on in the ePortfolio research community? Or how do I get started thinking about digital ethics? Joining the task force, we've had so many research questions arise where it's like, oh, someone should study that. One of us should study that. Um, and so there's just so, so, so much more work and conversation to be had. Yeah, they're sure. And I and I don't in our part of the world, we're not really awakened yet to the actual complex nature that's going to be hitting on digital ethics generally. Because we're all just trying to keep getting teaching online and assessment, you know, and everyone's exhausted. So they're trying to sort of keep going. But this is very preemptive of what, you know, conversations that are going to come up. Well, looking at the Oh, sorry, Kevin. <laughs> Looking at that second question on the slide uh, about how we use that in our local context, one of the things I've been thinking about over our last two years um, is past Megan. Megan M uh, would often teach ethical concerns kind of at the end of faculty development in terms of e portfolios. Like, also, you need to think about accessibility and you need to think about this, that, and the other. And so one of my takeaways from this time with this group is that I now ensure that every session I have hits an ethic in some way. Like, please don't think, take this on critically. Let's, 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 let's spend a little time troubling it and thinking about how you might solve that in your assignment design or how you might involve your students in that decision-making process. So I know that not every institution gets to do that. Uh, but at least for me, that was something that I started doing right away was uh, whenever I do talk with faculty, I'm able to hand them this document or say, hey, here's a principle that relates to the, the query you just gave me. Um, and so in that way, it's been helpful because it's not just Megan Mize thinks that you should be thinking about cost and mobile devices. It's, uh, it's lent a weight to it uh, that is really quite uh, helpful. So uh, I did want to I did want to touch on that. That's a good point to, to highlight, Megan. And as we've seen in the chat, um, Amy writing, moving from the compartmentalized model to seeing digital ethics as the through line, so that we really not push it to the end or at the beginning and then don't touch upon it again, but really bring it in on a regular basis. Pulling on some ideas that have emerged in the last couple of minutes. Christine talked about maybe collapsing or combining principles 
And I'm thinking it might be better to keep them small and more interconnected with the way that Megan Mize was encouraging us to have the linkages that Scalar allows us to do. Um, the more you combine, the more things get conflated and you might lose aspects of one or the other. And I think it emerged in um, one of the discussions about identity where Candace Reynolds was saying she's got 57 portfolios and they have different purposes and the whole idea of an ecosystem of micro portfolios, we have an ecosystem of micro principles, but um, because that's so complex, having some entry points at each principle, just like you have an on-ramp at different streets on a freeway. Uh, one that emerged in our conversation was a more straightforward, proactive call to action. If you're viewing this principle about diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, decolonization, take a moment, reflect on your identities and those that give you privilege, those that don't, and, and then take the step to determine what's your role in beyond awareness, taking action and making sure that it's appropriate and all that stuff. So, and that might get into some of those, again, students talking to students video so that they know how to apply some of these digital ethics principles at when they're asked to participate in e-portfolio activities, stuff for educators, stuff for employers, stuff for alumni, stuff for a portfolio developers, we can start creating this rich ecosystem but giving people entry points at their uh, textbook project. Uh, full, I've said enough. Kevin, I, I love everything you're saying. It, it touches on something that our, our breakout room talked about, which is the principles at this point does a nice job of the how, but maybe doesn't always talk about the why. Like, why is this important? Why do we do this work? Um, I think Brandy said it like, Am I doing this because Amy told me to do this in a principal's document, or am I doing this because there's this larger conversation happening? And so I, I love the idea of getting at the why. And also, yes, if you want to write a textbook on this with me, just just hit me up. You know my email. And I, I mean, we've, we've just been talking about the textbook, but I'd also like the other ideas of videos or audio interviews of people and having that multimodality then there and maybe even um, getting a completely different representation of how a person thinks about digital ethics that we haven't come up with so that it doesn't even have to be an image or a video, but something very, very different. And how can we add that to, to that representation? Because text is one way of representing it that works for, for a good group of people and videos work for another, yet others have their TikToks and so on. So kind of really playing with the, the possibilities that we have, I think would be a fantastic option. Well, and I think the whole idea of digital stories um, for me really resonates here. And uh, Teresa and a bunch of other um, folks from the ABLE community contributed to a book that we did on storytelling and education, but um, where we really surfaced, like, why do we do the things that we do as educators? What, what happened to us over the course of our careers that have shaped how we understand what it is we do? And I'm imagining that it would be really powerful you know, the diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, decolonization, you know, of course would speak to that. But I think any of these principles like, oh, I wrote the RFP to get a platform on my campus and oops, I didn't even know about these things. And, you know, as a result, this is what I'm thinking now. And here's how I'm using these principles moving forward. Because I think when we hear other people's stories, it resonates in a way that um, sometimes just reading the text doesn't. So um, I just wanted to Make another plug for that. So embed those in your textbook, Kevin and Amy. They are wonderful platforms out there for doing projects like that. And Scala is just one of them that we had wanted to explore because it's not that linear reading project. But if you haven't explored it yet, I'd encourage you to click on the 
I think it's the compass where you can look into visualizations and Sarah and Amy have done a wonderful job linking principles already so that you can see, okay, which ones belong together, how are they connected? And there is definitely still a lot of possibilities of how we can make additional connections and have these different representations to give people different ways into the principles. I guess we're, we're combining um, questions two and three, how we see ourselves applying this resource and how we can in increase the applicability. Uh, we're talking about different ways to get the word out. And when I was um, in the breakout with Barry, we were talking about, well, can any institute use this if they did want to use it, if they were new to it, how would they even find it? I mean, I think those are, are important questions as well. How, how do we get the word out in multiple ways, multiple media? Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And that's where we might also leverage our other partnerships and think about, you know, how might Merlot use this uh, set of principles or, or link to them? How might, might AACNU in the Value Institute and their assignment design work um, leverage some of these principles? And so I think that's maybe we need a um, as part of year three, a bit of um, a wayfinding group to kind of go out and, and see, you know, like here's Niloa here. And, and those are conversations we've had at ABLE. It's just, you know, how, how do we do that? We only have so many hours in the day. So that might be a really nice um, committee to kind of explore what could some partnerships to really bring um, this work to, to the focus of other groups um, would be good. And they would be able to contribute back in as well um, in some ways I'm imagining. Yeah, that's such an excellent point, Tracy. And I'll, I'll just plug, uh, we'll have a few presentations at HIPS in the state in October um, and the ePortfolio Forum in Australia. And so we're, we're excited to keep talking about this in different spaces, but that's, that's certainly a, a part of it. Well, and if we if we get other user or other audiences, right? Like uh, if we get students involved and we get employers and alumni, you know, part of what we argue about in ePortfolio work is that it can extend beyond the institution, right? And so maybe they'll have ways of sharing the principles that are different from conferences and workshops, you know, different what we typically gravitate towards. So, you know, talking about uh, Kevin's reference to TikTok resumes earlier, maybe the students will be like, we need a TikTok on these principles. Who knows? Like they may have other strategies and ways of sharing that we have not thought of. Um, so not just informing the design of them, but sharing the communication of them to other people. It makes me think of um, when I was starting to do work here in British Columbia, and they were really keen at the time on co-curricular transcripts. And, um, at, and I really wasn't keen on those. I wanted to really focus on e-portfolios, but I was engaged in some conversations and I, I did go to, uh, a student affairs event and um, I was a faculty member although administrator too at the time and you know I was listening to these student affairs professionals lament those stupid faculty who just never you know pay attention to what we're doing and I, I remember saying so do you go to faculty development conferences like have you presented your work and they were like oh no and I'm like well they don't know you exist <laughs> that's why you're not having this shared conversation so I think we need to be you know getting into those spaces where we can start to do that for sure and I'll just say, in all fairness, faculty also think the same thing about student affairs people. <laughs> it's just like, what do they know? They don't come to our conferences, so <laughs> they don't understand what we do. Any other thoughts on um, applying this resource as we start to kind of wind down our, our brief discussion? I, I know we've said it in the comments and during your conversation earlier today, um, but one of the things as, as we have these big plans for, <laughs> for things to add, but we talked about, uh, you know, adding sample activities that people could just grab and be like, how do I talk to people about privacy in their e-portfolios? Well, here's a sample activity that if you're totally new to it, you know, you could adapt. Uh, I think things like that would be really helpful in having them, you know, tagged at the bottom of the principle or, or something like that. Because I know folks across ABLE have brilliant assignments or brilliant conversation starters and they sit with us when they could be more far reaching and help folks 
um, with really the boots on the ground kind of work. So that I thought was a really lovely uh, suggestion from earlier. And we add, add that to our, um, we've got the principles and then we've got the scenarios. Could we add activities to each of them as well? Why, Teresa, why not? Um, yes, why not? Here, it's peace coming <laughs> up. And, they're going to um, grow, grow longer. Yeah. Anyway, aren't they? So. Well, or it, they could be on different on sub, or sub pages of the, the principle or so. And uh, Barry, to answer your question, how do I find the principle document in the web ether? Just Google it. Um, that is a very good point because we certainly need to link it more from publicly available uh, sites. Currently version two, you are the first ones to see the URL in this session because it was just launched as part of um, our Hackathon Creatathon on the digital ethics. And it is also linked from the ABLE website at the moment, but we are certainly looking into how we can promote it more and we'll also put in a link um, into the portal document. And if you want to use it, point people to it so that we get more search engine traction in public, um, publicly available websites, that would be awesome. I guess we could also have a link to it in our own ePortfolios. Uh, I, for one, will be posting it on our ePortfolio support page for the institution. So I will, I will, I will be pointing. You'll see a lot of traffic from ODU. So if you're wondering why Norfolk in particular seems really curious, uh, that's where we'll be using it. And, and like I say, weaving it into faculty development. And so with that, I think we're ready to transition to our last our last move of the hackathon. Um, and so uh, Megan Mize, take it away. Well, everyone, we so enjoy the opportunity to share this with you all and to solicit your input and your feedback. And frankly, I know uh, just listening to my colleagues talk about the other breakout rooms that you would be a wonderful addition <laughs> to the ePortfolio Digital Ethics Task Force. Um, and so if you are interested in joining us, uh, there is the link in the chat. Uh, we are asking that you submit an application uh, by September 1st. It really just lets us know what your interest is, kind of how you see your involvement uh, in the team. Uh, but frankly, we, we just enjoy growing that community. As you can see, there's tons of work to be done. Many hands make light work and also I think more effective work. So we hope you will consider applying. There will be a call that goes out after this conference too, I'm sure. And uh, you can always reach out to any of us on Slack and we will share this link with you. But um, we want people from across the spectrum of experience and every voice matters um, in this conversation. So uh, if you have any questions, please do reach out to us. The call is open. And, you know, feel free to submit right away, right after this presentation, because you're, you're ener energized and enthused. So um, we would love to have you. And Brandy, yes, I think we can wrestle up some kind of a pin. Um, Yay. If, you, if you don't know where that joke is coming from, please watch the recording of the presentation from Griffiths University yesterday afternoon, um, because there the, uh, the reward for students um, having finished their portfolios or, um, for an extracurricular activity is pineapple pens, and that is working wonders. It is a very lovely story of how they got to it. And if you know of people who, who might not yet be members of the ePortfolio community, but are members of um, kind of groups that we've been talking about in the principles, and you feel like they should be part of those conversations and have very good insight into any of the efforts that um, the task force of year three is looking into, then please do invite them as well and pass on the resources. And is it already okay to mention who will be leading next year's task force? Um, because I think it is Megan Mice who's not yeah. going to say that she <laughs> is. <laughs> well, I was just like, well, sure. Yeah, um, I, I think if I'm understanding it correctly, Megan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's gonna be three co-chairs in that uh, Sarah, who's not with us tonight, 
um, Megan Haskins and myself. I hope that doesn't deter you uh, from joining, but because year three, we have a number of big goals uh, and new goals. Uh, we feel that the coming year, we want to kind of split it into uh, groups and subgroups of the task force. And of course you can be in all of the groups, how much you want to work is entirely up to you. Um, but we have uh, ideas in terms of research, uh, ideas in terms of refining the principles and uh, goals for training folks in the principles uh, and applying the principles. So uh, a lot of big goings on in the year that uh, Megan and Sarah were kind enough to invite me to coach here with them. So Christina, thank you for remembering that. I, I uh, clearly did not <laughs> as, as a way of enticing people to join. Yeah. And I'll just add to that, that in, in the third year, we're really trying to be more mindful of how we onboard new practitioners as a part of the task force. And so if you know of people who specifically are maybe newer to ePortfolios, that's a very welcomed and encouraged group of the of the um, ePortfolio practitioners. So please don't let being new to ePortfolios or maybe not being as familiar with the ethical side of it deter you from applying. Yes, I think I can say we uh, none of us joined as an expert, but we learned along the way. And um, at least for me, it, I, I specifically joined the task force to take the time to look in particular into uh, some of those principles and ideas and therefore make the, the considered effort just to take that time and learn through that process. So it sounds like maybe we're at a stopping point. Uh, if anyone has questions or if, if they'd like to talk about it. Oh yeah, go ahead, Christina. Yeah, I think maybe just um, something a little bit logistical for how the how the task force works for those of you here in the room that might be thinking of joining. Um, we had this this year somewhat irregular uh, meeting times, typically I think between four every four and six weeks um, due to the current situation and everybody still working quite a bit more on campus with remote and high flex and so on. So it wasn't as structured as some of the meetings we had last year. Uh, but I find it worked out really, really well that way because that gave us the opportunity to work in quiet with our co-investigators um, on the individual principles and then meet up in the larger group to discuss topics or to ask questions and then um, bring forward the production of the principle. And of course, with the ideas that we have for year three, that might again look very different. But what we try to do is really find a meeting time that is suitable to everybody, which to be honest, has been quite difficult um, due to the time zones. Um, since we were all the way from Australia to the East Coast in the United States. And so finding a time that worked across um, many different time zones across different peoples and their work schedules and lives and all of that can be challenging. Um, but I think we we managed for the for the most part. And then also uh, Sarah always sent out some meeting notes so that there was the possibility to catch up if somebody was not able to attend a meeting and then work in the smaller groups. And then of course, in the smaller groups, there was the other coordination was a bit easier since you only had to bridge maybe two or three time zones at once and not five or seven. And so just to, to mention a few things that are in the chat that don't make it into the recording, um, Karen said, as follow on from what I just mentioned, that there are pathways for asynchronous participation if you have to miss a meeting. And um, folks, um, Megan then saying, folks are always invited to offer asynchronous input when attending meetings is difficult. And what we've really worked with was Google Docs so that we use the suggesting functionality and the commenting functionality in order to make it easy to see what has changed, what is somebody thinking, leaving, leaving the other team members notes for it and um, using which other, whichever channel we are comfortable in preparing this document. And so um, Sarah then did the monumental task of moving all that content from the many different files that we had and put that into Scalar so that not everybody needed to learn yet another software, but we worked in an environment that was uh, very collaborative. 
as, um, as Megan Weiss says, we want to make involvement accessible and possible to all who want to participate. Because that is one of our principles. So what we want to do there is really also practice what we talk about and see how we can also improve our practice, how we can change our own practice. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. Amy, Amy started too. So I, I know we're at the end of the day. And uh, Kevin has very dutifully included the form to give feedback on the presentation. We hope you will. Uh, Christina shared the proposal for tomorrow. So I look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow throughout the conference and, and learning more from everybody. And uh, if anybody has any closing comments or questions, we certainly invite them now. Uh, and we appreciate your engagement and your patience and your endurance. Um, I think it's really to the betterment of a, of a lot of folks involved. So please know it's very much appreciated. And a, a shark tank first thing in the morning, <laughs> brave souls. Uh, it's so much fun. I, I look forward to seeing what everyone does tomorrow. Well, on behalf of Abel, I just really wanna thank all of you um, who have been on the task force for all of the hard work that you've done and for really bringing the, these important issues to the fore of our thinking in the ePortfolio community and uh, really excited about the work that you're continuing to do into year three. So just thank you so much from uh, the whole community. We're um, in your debt and look forward to what is next on your agenda. Have a good rest of your evening or day, everyone. Thanks for being here. Well, I think, um, at least from my end, I'd also like to, to thank the ABLE board to give us the, the opportunity to actually be a task force and work on those principles and support us in that work. And also in initially then having recognized that that is a very important topic with lots and lots of different subtopics that will be good to explore. And as we've seen, it's now already in the second year. So clearly the, the community um, does need it and the conversations and even just the conference topic um, illustrates that we do have those conversations and maybe not always necessarily labeling them digital ethics, but it, it's coming through in those discussions in the work that uh, practitioners and also researchers and academics do. And so it is good to give it more of a of the visibility to say we are not just doing it um, accidentally, but there is actually um, a purpose behind it and we know why we are doing it. And so I'd very much like to recognize the, the board for realizing that we should put focus on that as community. Here, here, Christina. And to know that it's being received so well. The International Journal for ePortfolio Reviewer, one of the comments for an article submitted about the principles, something to the effect, and someone can correct me, this is one of the most significant contributions to the field I've seen in years. And so I think we have an obligation to move this forward to get the word <laughs> out. I've already committed in the chat to wearing a sandwich board in the streets of San Francisco. <laughs> and so I will learn how to fly and do sky writing over the state of your choice, whatever <laughs> it takes to get the word out. Um, but I, I just wanna say as a member of the board and the task force, I am honored to be part of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.